Today we are going to talk about images from post-Westphalia or sounds all around the Orient, literature, transregional or transcultural. My name is Alke Kramer. I am head of the research department of for Droste Literature. We have Dr. Özkan Esli here via video. Dr. Noah Ha is with us and Martina Wagner Engelhaf is here as well. This event is being simultaneously interpreted into English. I'm going to introduce our guests really quickly, then they are going to give us a five-minute input each from their perspective, and then we have a discussion round that you are very welcome to participate in. If you watch us on the stream, you can post your questions in the chat, and if you are here, you can just raise your hand yeah. and ask your question Martina directly. Wagner Martina Wagner Egelhaft is Professor of Modern Münster German Literature at Münster University. And before that, she was Professor in Bochum. She did her PhD on the on short stories on in melancholy. She has already focused on Annette von Doster-Hülshoff's Sounds from the Orient in her work, and she actually created a new position for that work. She also looked into transculturalism and into the biography of Doster. In 2020, she published her book in the Wallenstein Publishing House on Goethe. She is working on different projects, for example, a project on the cultural history of the hate and also a project that deals with politics. She is a guest professor in the US and Uzbekistan and many other cultures and therefore has a perspective that transcends our region. Thank you, Ms. Kramer. I'm happy to be here. I would like to start with my inputs. Annette von Drüsterhülsow wrote the following to Christoph Bernhard Schlüter, who together with his, with his brother-in-law Wilhelm Jungmann had taken over the supervision of her first edition of poems. And I quote, I have some time ago sent a number of oriental poems to young men for selection. Neither in your letter nor in his is any mention made of them. Surely they have not been lost. She received an answer only after the printing already had been completed. Schlüter informed her on August 2nd, 1838, that among the poems that did not make it into print were the very oriental poems that she had asked about. He gives the following reason for not including these poems, which were obviously important to the author. He said, only the pure, harmonious impression of the very first edition of your poems, in which everything should breathe a character and at the same time be completely original property of the author, nothing an imitation, nothing a foreign or disturbing element, only that was what we determined particular. So no imitations, nothing foreign, nothing disturbing. That was what the profile of the Westphalian Catholic poet Droste Hülshoff should have been. That is how she was canonized. Droste's small cycle, which was only published in its entirety in 1860, is to be seen in the context of the first half of the 19th, 19th century, when the Orient was fashionable. Works from the same period are Goethe's West Eastern Divan, Friedrich Rückert's Orientalization, um, poetry, and the Gazelen of August. From Annette von Rostelzow was directly inspired to her sounds from the Orient by the collection Rose Oil, first and second vial, or legends and customs of the Orient from Arabic, Persian, and Turkish sources, which was published by the Orientalists Josef von Hammer Purgstall in 1830. Although there is no evidence that Droste dealt with Goethe's West Eastern Divan, research has been 
able to show numerous correspondences between the two poetry collections. But how different Droste's Orient looks. Whereas Goethe's Divan sketches an idealized poetic Orient in which West and East productively encounter each other in cross-fertilizing interchange, Droste's Orient is a world dominated by violence and the drawing of boundaries, blood, death, tears and suffering are obviously the price for crossing borders. If it is true that the Orient's image in the literature and culture of the 19th century can be read as an alienated reflection of one's own society, and there is much to be said for this, then Droste's Orient poems can also be seen as a kind of experimental field on which she could try out herself as an author, but where she also put the following elements into literary play, the demarcations of society of her own time, such as those between above and below, rich and poor, power and powerlessness, men and women. The cycle contains a series of verses that she herself calls language exercises. And that practice-like experimental aspect applies, I think, to all the poems in the cycle. The language game in the sounds of the Orient stages a speech that enters new poetic territory insofar as it practices a game of being and unveiling with regard to the speech positions of the so-called lyrical I, an ambiguity between the cycle I, I and the role I, thus a thoroughly resistance poetics of floating. Vielen Dank, Frau Wagner Egelhaf, für diesen Einblick in Annette Trostow. Thank you very much for this insight into Annette Trostow's sounds from the Orient, and I'd like to hand over to our next guest, Dr. Özkan Esli. He is a private professor for cultural studies at the University of Tübingen, and I would like to congratulate you. I would like to Really, I'm, I'm very impressed because your book, Narratives of Migration, has just been awarded with the De Gruyter Verlag Open Access Prize and with the Augsburg Science Prize for Intercultural Studies. With this book, Mr. Özkan Esli has also habilitated himself. He did his doctorate with the under the title Grenzen der Kultur, Autobiographies and Travel Descriptions between Orient and Occident, that was published in 2012. And he also wrote a lot on transculturality um, in literature, in film. Um, he wrote about bathing with the burkini, and he also wrote on the chronicle of integration. Mr. Esli, thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. And I hope the PowerPoint will be working. Oh, there it is. So I also only have five minutes. And yes, the title is Post-Westphalian Literature Between Social Structures and Identity Politics. And I would like to talk about three scenes of migration story of the Federal Republic of Germany. First thing that I want to talk about is the following. I I'm not going to talk about social structures as much because I'm more interested in the difference between Occident and Orient, the context of migration and literature between the 60s and now. And I want to actually look at actual and non-actual. And it kind of sounds contradictory, but I'm not talking about the own and the foreign. No, I want to talk about what we in German call eigentlich and Uneigentlich. So what is and what is not really. So for me, those two things aren't opposites. Um, I'm going to talk about that when I talk about the text that I chose. But I would say what is very special about it is what is called Eigentümlichkeit in German, which resonates to ownership. So
Let's look at the first scene. These are scenes of social action. This scene is set in 1983 between Fulda and um, Kassel on the train. In 1983, the author Eisel Özerkin had to leave Turkey. Um, she fled to Germany. And on this train, she meets an older lady. And this older lady asks her whether she's French. The old lady smiles at me. And I know that she smiles at me because she thinks I'm French. And I say, no, I'm not French. But she doesn't keep asking. And then there's a monologue where Eisel Özerkin writes, I want them to know that I didn't come to their country to live off them, that I didn't learn about civilization only when I got here, that I'm not stupid, that I'm not dependent on a man. Yes, that I even know how to speak French. I want to tell them all this in order to free myself from their idea of a Turkish woman. At the same time, I find myself in this thought ridiculous. And not long after that, he tells the woman, I am from Turkey. And the monologue, I said it. And what I find very interesting about this part of the book, then one can say that she says, well, actually, it is ridiculous that I come out of the closet as a Turkish woman. But nonetheless, she does it to work against that image of the other side. And the interesting aspect of that idea is that in the end, this dialogue leads to a friendship, a social relationship. And that's where I see the distinction between the actual and the non-actual. Because the non-actual is the national category, being Turkish, being French, being German. And uh, she was a French teacher in Turkey, so she could be a French when it comes to her education and the context. And Heidegger, when he talks about the actual and the non-actual and he moves into the public sphere, then there's a whole possibility for existing in a situation. That situation can lead to so much more in an encounter when we decide between when we differentiate between the actual and the non-actual. So let's move over to the next slide in 1991. So we were on the train, but what I forgot to mention before that is the coexistence, the so-called convivence that Otmar Ente talked about yesterday. So if we look at the differentiation between actual and unactual, what we have, what is generated is a coexistence. So now we're in a coffee cafe in Berlin. We're not on the train anymore. And I quote, in my language, tongue means language. A tongue has no bones. Wherever you turn it, it turns there. So I sat there with my twisted tongue in the city of Berlin. An old croissant sits wearily on my plate. I immediately give Bakshish the beta shouldn't be ashamed. If only I knew when I lost my mother's tongue. Me and my mother once spoke in our mother tongue. My mother said to me, you know, you speak like this. You think you're narrating everything, but suddenly you jump over unsaid words, and then you narrate calmly, and I jump with you. Then I breathe calmly. Calmly. She then says, you left half your hair in Alemania. I now remember mother's sentences she said in her mother tongue only when I imagine her voice. The sentences themselves came to my ears like a foreign language that I had well learned. So what is so special about language, about nation, is being turned in something completely new, a cultural appropriation. And as you can see, this part of the book is full of translation. Deal in Turkish actually means language and tongue. And this intertwining works 12 years later when she says, okay, I turned my tongue into the German language and it made me happy. So once again, we have this coexistence, this convivence that exists because of language. Let's look at the third slide. So we're now in Hamburg. Dile Günger and her book, I am Özlem. Ich bin Özlem from 2019. So she arrived. Okay. And I quote. So before we said the Turkish language, the German language sort of led to a new creation of a language. Now we are actually somewhere else. The, the external, the Turkish language as a cultural marker becomes something actual. And that's a problem here. So the protagonist was born in Germany. And like Eisel, she speaks German. She's married to a German husband. Her kids are called Emil and Antonia, and she says, okay, what am I without the Turkish language? What is left? 
Is that the right order? Children, husband, work, and I forget the painting, a bit of cooking, um, and meeting friends maybe every once in a while, if only that weren't true. So, before that, civilization, education was sort of something positive that led to equality. And what is reached is sort of devaluated, and the unactual, that is the discourse, is being turned into the translation. And the consequences of that, and that is a bit provocative, despite the fact that Dilek Gringo isn't Turkish, this novel is very much focusing on discriminative experiences. So there are some scenes, for example, where her friends talk about problematic schools, and then they talk about why they would exclude her in their circle. But she lives with those friends, and that's where there's a break in the coexistence. And then in the end, she says, it's impossible to become a part of it, to belong, to then switch sides. You have to be on the right side straight from the beginning. And this leads me to the conclusion, last slide. So 1983, social structure, education, and a joint civilization create values, and they define what the person is. So it's not important that she's Turkish. So nationalisms and essentialisms are the unactual. 1991, identities are the result of processes, translations, and so on. They are appropriations. So any loss, migration is always loss, can become, become the unactual, and it can be something that you can benefit from. And then today, 2019, social structure, education, and joint civilization are the unactual experience of an uh, of a loss of value. The non-accessible origin becomes the actual, but without getting lost of this process of cultural appropriation. So Isaac Oedelsen answers that older lady to correct that image that lady has of Turkish people. And she then says, okay, it is ridiculous that I'm doing this, that I'm defending myself, but she doesn't know what to do better, so she does it. And today we say, okay, why do we speak that way? despite the fact that we know better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Özli. Our third guest, Dr. Noah Ha, I can't see her yet, but she's joining us digitally, virtually. She's in Berlin, but she's also here, luckily. Hi, Ms. Ha, nice to see you. She's a post-colonial urban researcher. At the moment, she's a guest lecturer at the Weissensee Kunsthochschule Berlin, and she heads the National Racism and Discrimination Monitor at the German Center for Integration and Migration Research, DZIM. She studied it, um, architecture on informality and racism at the TU Berlin. She did her doctorate there, and she did research on universities in Berlin and Dresden. She focuses on critical integration um, research and racism. She is soon going to publish the anthology European Cities, Modernity, Race, and Colonialism that is edited together with Dr. Giovanni Picca. Ms. Ha, I'm very much looking forward to your input. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation here to this castle. Unfortunately, I couldn't travel there, and I'm therefore joining you virtually. So, I'm also coming from a different discipline. I'm not a literary st a scholar, nor am I an orientalist. As was already mentioned, my research interests are post-colonial urban studies as well as racism, integration, and migration studies, or to put it differently, social research. I'm interested in why someone becomes someone while others become others. I'm interested in how this knowledge emerges, circulates, informs and establishes social hierarchies in a seemingly natural way. How can it be that something, that they can do something better than others? How can that be? One of the reasons is the legacy of colonialism from which racism emerged, a racism that still persists and has a history that goes back centuries. A history that teaches us about migration, about the Orient and other parts of the world, and about home. 
It is a fascination. Uh, it is fascinating that the colonial imagination about the others, without any contact and from afar, has fueled entire books and fantasies, as witnessed, for example, in the stories of Karl May, in which he told a tale of the Wild West with noble so-called Indians and fighting cowboys, stories that he had not experienced himself but had heard from others. But the fiction goes even further. Colonialism as an era of global world order that, through a seemingly natural difference of people, their appearance and geographic origin, establishes hierarchy between them that makes some civilized, developed and superior, and others underdeveloped, uncivilized and inferior. 19th century science was instrumental in establishing this seemingly natural hierarchy when it measured, catalogued and divided people into human races using eye color charts, hair color charts, voice recorders, skull gorges, cameras and other tools. This colonial legacy still lingers in our knowledge of a global world order because we have learned it, we've practiced it, we've normalized it for centuries, even though we know that the genetic differences between people in Europe are much greater than between two people from the African continent and Northern Europe. There is no scientific evidence that plausibilizes the distinction in groups of people into a natural, one could say, ranking. A distinction that we now know was not only based on racist assumptions and intended to scientifically plausibilize that racism, but a distinction that is also a fiction. A fiction about us humans on this planet, a fiction that continues to create realities and structure global and local relationships to this day. We're all human beings. We're all equal human beings. We've given ourselves a, a certain rights, the human rights, because the history of mankind has taught us that we're able to deny people their humanity and to kill other people without feeling shame and injustice, although we know we are not supposed to kill. Thus, this colonial history is also a history of migration, even though it is commonly not understood that way. The migration of Europeans to the farthest corners of the world to settle there and meet the people there with superiority and to civilize them either benevolently or by force, that is to subjugate them. That's also a story of migration. Language played an important role in the subjugation of whole peoples. Thus, the civilizing mission of the Europeans was to transmit their languages from Europe which are still used today in some former colonized countries, either as the national language, English, French, Portuguese, Spanish, or as in the case of Indonesia, as the language of the constitution, in this case, Dutch. That means that the multilingualism of the African continent and other continents was drastically minimized in the course of colonialism and is still an important theme of decolonization today. If I think of the work of Ngui Vatjongo and his essays on African languages and literature, an authoritative writer on the African continent, a continent not often honored with Nobel Prizes in literature. As the discussion around this year's Nobel laureate, Abdul Razak Gurna, showed. And as Bhakti Sringapur noted on the website, Africa is a country. For all the joy of awarding the prize to an African author, Ngui Vatjongo has not yet received the prize. And whether Sringapur asks if there is an elephant in the room, because Abdul Razak Gurna writes in English. And the path of indigenous African languages to the podium of Nobel laureates seems to be still a very long way to go.
With this brief digression on the subjugation and annihilation of indigenous languages, which takes on great importance, especially in the context of decolonization, I would like to point out that the multilingualism of society, or even of a world society, is quite complex. And yet, beyond this circumstance, one can state that multilingualism is a circumstance that is a normal state for the majority of the world's population. The ability to think, feel, and be at home in different languages is the rule rather than the exception. The ability to be able to switch between different concepts and thinking figurations of space, time, and universal reference. The ability, for example, to notice the gendered language of German with great astonishment when one learns German from Turkish, for example, and wonders that objects also have a gender, or why is it called die Tür and der Stuhl. Thus, the Art and Society magazine Freizeit in the early 2010s testified to the transcultural dimension of German language and cultural production. Out of this context, well-known authors have emerged who now occupy the German stage, such as Sascha Mariana Salzmann or Dennis Utlu. A magazine that focused on the play of the German language when native tongue habits were broken and given new meaning. A linguistic ability that inhabits new spaces and languages. When I think here of the work of Sascha Stanisitz, Sharon Dodua Otu, Feridun Zaimoglu, Olivia Wenzel, Senturan Varantaraja, Emine Sevki Östama, and many others. Finally, I would like to mention the author Yoko Tawada. A Japanese author who lives in Germany, who is literarily processed being a stranger in the German language and has written wonderful texts, also about Europe. And I'd already talked about colonial Europe, and I would like to close with a quote from Yoko Tawada. Actually, you can't tell anyone, but Europe doesn't exist. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Ms. Ha, for your input. That was a lovely conclusion as well. So if I listen to the examples that you mentioned, all three of you, I would say that cultural expressions anchored in culture are also in, always exist in the field of tension of two movements. On the one hand, the construction of two homogenous units, or at least one homogenous unit, which is the identity of one's own, and then the contrast to that is the foreign, the other. And then on the other hand, it becomes apparent that both the own and the foreign are already always hybrid. So language, literature are always hybrid. And we saw that language always mix with other languages who never have one pure language. And literature reflects on that. You mentioned Emine Sevke Öztema in um, Grandfather's Tongue, the narrator learns, um, the Turkish protagonist learns Arabic in German, and she learns that Arabic words are often the root of Turkish words. So there are many more examples like that, I would say. So I would be interested to hear how can the hybridity of one's own can be highlighted so that we can be open to the other? Or is that that we strive for identities? Is that another important aspect? How can we create a stable identity if we take that hybridity into mind and if we don't want to hide away that hybridity? That question goes to all three of you. Oh, that's, a, that's a tough question, I'd say. What does that even mean, stable identity? If we look at the identity discourse that exists today, I think we get the feeling that we are looking for stable identities, and only a few decades ago, 
it was perceived as liberating that boundaries became more and more fluid. And that is a development of that discourse that goes back into looking to fix an identity, looking for fixed foundations. I mentioned Annette von Droste-Hülsow's way of dealing with identities, and I think she does it quite differently than our contemporary literature does, especially when we look at sounds from the Orient. It's a lot about boundaries, and at the same time, she reflects on what those boundaries actually cause. She reflects on the brutality of those boundaries. And by highlighting that, she tries to take the boundaries that exist in her time, the boundaries that she faces herself personally as author, as a woman, and she tries to highlight those boundaries through her poetry. She criticizes the boundaries, she reflects on them, and maybe she tries to actually put fixed identities into question. Just because um, that was my example that I mentioned with Özdemar, I think identity is stable if it is if it evolves. If that process stops, identity gets destabilized. So that process of identification is crucial here. If you read literature, you identify with different protagonists, protagonists with different figures with others who don't identify. And that is true for the entire society as well. You always evolve. It's always a process. If you look into your own biography as well, you see a lot of shifts there. And I think we can approach that question of identity if we take those microstructures in mind. And that is why I mentioned I want to differentiate between the actually and the unactually. Because the real differentiation is the differentiation between the public and the personal, the private. You take something from yourself and you try to reflect that somewhere and you might see different practices and then you need to translate that. Robert Ezra Park did exactly that in Chicago in the 1920s, 1930s, when in the south of the US many black people migrated to Chicago in order to find work there. So that was multiculturalism back then. And that's when one of the first migratory um, studies actually got around, were co constructed, and when it became about appropriation. And back then, that was seen as the future of civilization. What I mentioned with us with Östamar, she plays the Turkish person in order to play to the other person to show we are equals, we are the same. So that's a tran transcultural overlap here in her practice. And she talked about an, an opportunity for existing in that situation. So I think it's important when we talk about racism and many other important debates, it's important that we look at convivience, at coexistence. We are here together in a shared space and we need to find ways to talk to each other. And what I see in films, in media, everywhere, that are always conversations, and that is what fills literature with life. Literature lives on stereotypes that I play a specific role. That connection between the public and the private space, actually and unactually, these processes, if they, these processes are stable, then identity is stable. But it also means that I am vulnerable in the public space. But, but if I only listen to the world, world foreign, or let's just take the question, where are you from originally? In the 1980s, that was an element to start a conversation. It's, it was just to start a conversation. Now, that might be perceived as racism, if you ask, where are you from? I understand that 
If you are born here and you get that question, that you are angry about that, but you need to understand that the other side, and here we have a failure of the majority of the society, that the majority of the society does not know about that migrant history, and we need to spread that knowledge. And then at one point people won't need to ask that question anymore. But that question can be a sign of interest in the other. And if we take that speculative space and take that question, for example, and then interpret it in a single way, then that's a problem because that stops that process. That would be my answer. Maybe about the differences that overlap. I thought that was interesting. It was something that all three of you mentioned. You all showed that there's not that one big cultural difference between the own and the foreign, but that it's always overlapping. Old, young, men, woman, poor, rich. I find it especially interesting and striking when we talk about gender questions. That is also what Annette von Roster-Hülshoff wrote about, and it's very clear that she tried to talk about gender boundaries in the sounds of the Orient. How does that work in contemporary literature? Are we also talking about gender and cultural boundaries in the same way? Yeah, absolutely. I moderated Mango Yababi. Um, I don't know if you know the column. I uh, read her. No, um, I. I I really loved her novel of Yabogi Farah, and she looked at queer people and people of color, and she differentiated between those groups. But when it is about the white German person, then they are of the same opinion. And I asked, why is there not one good white person? Wasn't there always one good white person, even during the barbarism of slavery in the US, there was always one good white person, even if white people committed those atrocities. There, there was always room for one figure. And why does, does that not exist in your literature? Why is that? And she couldn't answer. She said, yeah, right, there's something wrong here. So that, that's where a potential lies. We can take that queerness that goes for new forms of community, for new forms of sisterhood, but the majority of society is homogenized. And that is something where I see a lot of potential in literature. And I think that with, ma with the majority of society, with white Germans, she, this author, is too critical. She treats them as if they are the co colonizers from yesteryear. And that is not true, because there's also a process happening there. So integration um, has been a huge topic since the 2000s, and that's just not reflected in that book. Maybe I can ask a question about Droste Hülshoff. Annette von Droste Hülshoff spoke a dialect with the, with the servants, with, the, um, with her nurse, with the farmers. She spoke something that is closer to Dutch. She spoke Low German rather than High German. And when we look at the sounds from the Orient and other works of her, we always find those Low German terms there. So she has a hybrid language herself already. So I would ask you, Ms. Wacker, Egelhaf, how, how would you judge that? How important is that multilingualism of Annette von droste hülshoff Of course, she wrote in high German, but she lived in different languages. Do you think that plays a bigger role in research than what research have, has discovered? <laughs> 
until now. And another question to Ms. Ha and Mr. Esley, and also to Ms. Wagner Egelhoff. Are there any parallels here to contemporary authors, authors that write in a different language, in a different culture, who maybe were born here, third, second or third immigrant generation, but they still speak and hear the language of their parents and grandparents. Can, do you think that is something we can compare here, that dialect of Joste Hülshoff and another language? Well, the Droste's texts weren't written in dialogue, dialect, but there are some regional specificities that, that can be found, and I think they're very important in her work. But they are not just connected with a language, but the regional elements with Droste comes in many different forms. The landscape, then also when you look at the description of personalities, of characters, characters. So the typical Westphalian, for example, that she describes in her in Bei uns zu Lande auf dem Lande, it's, it's almost a caricature. Or also dishes that are prepared and that are very typical for the region. The names of these dishes are probably not known all over Germany. So this multilingual um, aspect, yes, that exists in her text, and I think so far there is there is no systemic research that was done on that. A couple of years ago, I did a seminar together with a colleague of mine who's a linguist, and the seminar was about the regional aspects of language in literature. And we looked at Droste, Droste's text, but also at author likes Mureke, Uwe Jonsson, authors, uh, canonical authors, really. And then we realized that the regional aspects and the dialects play a way bigger role than what is um, negotiated in literature sciences. And I think, yes, it would make sense to look at Droste's texts. But then I think you also have to look at the context. So what are the characters like? What is the context? What is the surrounding? But yes, of course, even when she said, I want people to read about me in 100 years, she did want to make sure that people would read her all around Germany or even around the world. So it is a dimension that is there, but it's not predominant. But that's probably not what you wanted to say with your question. Thank you. Maybe Ms. Ha? The question was, I think, or maybe, the, I don't know if that, if that answers your question, but if you could compare, for example, the dialect or uh, multilingual aspects. But I, when I heard your question, I thought, okay, is it about that change of roles? Or is it, and that's what I wanted to talk about in my text, is it maybe does it have to do with competence to change perspectives? Because if I can speak one language, then it enables me to have a different perspective on other language, to maybe understand it in a different way. And that also has to do with the first question, stable identity. Because my first reaction was, what do we even need a stable identity for? Why? Would it that be relevant for us to even reflect on stable identity? And Ms. Eske, Mr. Eske talked about processes of identification and to actually think about that. But at the same time, I think the question about stable identities goes hand in hand with not just looking at the personal level and to articulate one own identity that is being questioned also when we talk about gender identity or the question about sexual identity, all of a sudden there is this diversity. And at the same time, we live in a time when the question about national identity is all of a sudden way more present in a, in a 
authoritarian way. And I think it is really a struggle about what the meaning of identity is. And the field of tension for me isn't just to ask about identity on an individual level, but to also think about a collective identity and the question of belonging. A nation does play a big role in all in this discourse for social political questions that we try to discuss here. Thank you very much. I think national literature, the center of uh, literature actually thought of that word. That was one of the reasons why we wanted to organize this event, because we wanted to ask ourselves, OK, we have all this in stock. How can we rethink national literature? How can we maybe overcome this term? And German literature, how can we read German literature in a different way? And Annette von droste hülshoff I think she's such an amazing example because you said Schlüter and Jungkamp, the edition of 1838, they didn't even publish the sounds from the Orient, despite the fact that Annette von droste hülshoff wanted it because it was too foreign and it sort of didn't go hand in hand with the image of this time and Paul Heiser the uh, third who also received a Nobel Prize for literature he uh, wrote a poem about Annette and it ends that way growing up lonely in the homeland field lonely despite heartfelt serious longing for love collecting eternal profit in silence clinging to God and nature alone all your tears ripened into pearls Thus, you became Germany's greatest poet. And yes, she is one of Germany's greatest poets. I think we all agree on that. And I think she rightly is so. But how? Can we maybe liberate her even more than in the last decades? How can we help her free herself from that obligation to supporting the founding of the nation state? What started during the Peace of Westphalia was accomplished with Germany being founded as a state in uh, back then. And that's when Annette von droste hülshoff became a national poet, one could say. Ms. wagner Egelhoff pointed out, pointed out how we can also kind of interpret her in a very different way as a very open-minded writer. But these other lectures also exist. And my question would be, how can we make sure that Annette von droste hülshoff can be one of the likes like uh, uh, other authors, more hybrid authors, who are open towards other languages and experiences. Can we read her that way? Is that possible? And how can we do so? Well, I would say the best way of doing that is to actually read her texts, to read them again and again. One example would be the Das Geistliche Jahr, the spiritual year. For a long time, that was perceived as religious poetry. And yes, it is religious poetry, because she wrote a poem for each day of the spiritual year. And yes, she writes about religious issues, the biblical texts that are sort of uh, go for each day. But some of those poems are almost atheist poems. They sort of speak up against that religious interpretation of poems. And if you see that, then you do realize that it is very difficult to categorize her, even though that people try to do that for a long time. What is also happening right now, and it's uh, very good that we do so, is that we point out how modern her poems are, that she was a modern poetess, that she wasn't a conservative Westphalian lady. And that's good, because she was very modern. Nonetheless, we have to see her as a, a child of her time. Modern elements that trans, uh, trans, trespass that era, yes, they are there. But nonetheless, we have to realize the changes that took place during her time. 
And I think that sometimes it is important to also see it as part of the process, if the dimensions that are sort of um, related to each other. And I think the sounds from the Orient are a very good example for that. Of course, you can find cliches in there. Orientalism in the first half of the 19th century, all that can be found in this wonderful poem. In, in some of the poems that we really love. But if you take a closer look, then you can also find a lot of brutality and violence. And I don't think you can read it in a way that you could say, okay, well, the Orient was simply brutal and people were cruel. Crossing the individual border, leaving that sort of confidence that is something that is understood as something violent and introduced into the Orient. That's what is within it. It's not the Orient that is violent. No, it's the limits, the boundaries of myself that are tested in this way. Yes, and I would like to add to that. That's absolutely wonderful. I really like your analysis from 96. We talked about it before you analyzed some of her poems. And when I reread the sounds from the Orient, I noticed one thing. It's not Orientalism. So Ms. Ha talked about mm, the progress and the opposite, but that's not what is found there. No, she describes passion. That's what I find there. She writes about violence in a transcultural way that can be found in different directions. And there is the existential level. And that's where you can find the connection, that novel, the Ingeborg Bachmann Prize, uh, was awarded, and it's an existentialist, surrealist text, but in the end it's about that experience in um, Turkey, the coup d'etat in Turkey, how she dealt with that, so violence is in the center, and everything that comes from the outside, the violence, to bring that back into what is actually existent leads to a new realism. And I mean, what she does is cultural appropriation, and Özdem also did that, but this form of cultural appropriation, identity is part of the process, and it's also a process where many others can relate to because that experience of violence is a global phenomenon. All of us are torn apart. All of us have experienced loss. And I have to say, I actually enjoyed that even more than Goethe's West Eastern Divan because that's just a talk between two guys. What you find there are two, uh, well, let's not call them old white men because they might not necessarily be old white men. Yes, but I agree. And when I read the sounds from the Orient again, then I realized, and I, I worked with those texts in 96 the first time, and I didn't realize it back then that Droste actually goes way further than the West Eastern Divan. The West Eastern Divan is sort of an illusion, this sort of very harmonic discussion between two who try to understand each other. They're almost forced to talk in harmony, and it's almost a lie. It's... <laughs> Yes, and Droste with her text is way more honest. She goes right in there, and it can be shocking. And then you try to find uh, aspects that could help in understanding each other. Yes, it's very different. Yes, it's no guideline for how to reach an understanding between the, ex, uh, the Occident and the Orient. So she actually looks right at the foundation, yes, and the society as well. So this love story, you know, it's always about hierarchy that leads to violence, killings. Uh, that, yes, that can be translated. It's a process. That's what literature does. I thought that was very, uh, it was, I enjoyed reading it again. Do we have five minutes left? Perfect, perfect.
Mr. Ette, you wanted to ask a question. So two points. You thought you talked about making identity more fluid, fluidifying identity. That's important, I'd say, and I would like to differentiate identity on object level and on a research level. So we need to tackle questions of identity that are being talked about on a literary level. But if we use that term of identity, that's always an othering of other groups, of under individuals, and that doesn't have a scientific basis. And that is something that all the different readers have shown since the 70s, since the 80s. It's a very complex term that can be used politically, and we see that at the moment very clearly. It is used to alienate others, to ostracize others. It is used as a political weapon. And another proposition that I would make, I would like to add to the differentiation that you mentioned between actually and unactually. My proposition would be that there should be a third category, and a third category, so actually, unactually, and nextually, you could say. So what Oslama, when Oslama talks about the tongue, so that movement between the two extremes, it, that would really, that third term, neigentlich, nextually, would actually er, add something in between those two terms, so that turn of the tongue would be reflected there. That mobility is also an important part of coexistence. Mobility is the foundation for coexistence, you could say. So there is an element right there that concerns a basic knowledge, a basic understanding of how we can live together and the concept, and I just thought that fit very well with your concept. Thank you very much. I think we have three minutes left. And Mr. Albrecht would like to say something. No, no, he wouldn't. All right, then we have time to respond to Mr. Ette's comment. If anyone would like to do that, yeah, it wasn't really a question, right? It was a proposition, and I think it was a good one, one that we should think about, because I asked myself, will we ever get away from all that polarization? That's what I asked myself, also thinking about actually and unactually. It seems to be difficult to leave that polarization behind us because maybe that's just the way we think. And I tried to take the unactually and see it in the following way. See it not as an absolute category. It's a category of distancing. It's not a fixed position. Unactually can be a lot. So it could also be scalable. That was just my, my process of thinking about that. So that term of naturally would actually fit with that very well. Yeah, Otmar, that's, that's a lovely parenthesis that you open there because that, that movement is in there and that adds to the two sides. With Özlama, there's a game, and she plays that game. That's how we analyzed it. She, as a narrator, is inside that game, and she makes herself visible in her poems. And that is where we saw that, that movement. So that's why I think that's an interesting parenthesis, because taking that 
term, and actually that can actually contribute to scaling the term. Heidegger talks about it as a public space, a space where people aren't decided yet, where a lot can still happen. So, yeah, it's really the connection between those levels, and you need that connection. You need a specific distance if you want to approach someone. If you only have that naturally, you can't approach anyone either. You need to have the two sides, and you need to be able to negotiate those sides. Yes, thank you very much. I would like to close this panel. So. We are going to take that new term, naturally, in addition to actually and unactually, we're going to take that home with us. And let's reread Annette von Roster-Hülshoff with that new term in mind. Thank you to our guests. Thank you to all three of you for being here with us. Thank you to our audience as well. And I would like to say thank you to the team of the Center of Literature for organizing this so well.